This is a response to a video by Laura Layla. Hi there, Laura Layla. This is your video about, I think it's called How Do You Think or How Do We Think, something like that. And you're talking there about, you know, the different, not just the different um, ways that people think, just in terms of, you know, do people think visually or do people think in a more kind of linear way? But also what kind of knowledge is produced by that? You talk about scientific knowledge. And I think you make a useful distinction there between science and scientism, which is different. And, and a little bit about academia. Um, a variety of things, really interesting stuff. What it brought to mind for me, really, is to do with, um, I guess, knowledge and scholarship, really. And I was reminded of a an author called Pascal Boyer. I hate to drop names, but he's a really interesting bloke, Pascal Boyer. He's an anthropologist, French anthropologist. He writes quite a lot about religion, particularly the, uh, the kind of anthropological origins of various religious practices. So a lot of his work kind of dips into uh, evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology, but at the other side it dips into more conventional kind of anthropological approaches and almost sociological approaches, political approaches. So he's fascinating in all kinds of ways, the things he writes about, anthropology of religion stuff. But in relation to what, to what we're talking about here, this idea of scholarship, knowledge, how we think, you know, what, what we might consider to be legitimate ways of thinking in order to arrive at something like they might call conclusions, or you know, whatever the purpose of thinking is, whether it is to arrive at a conclusion, or whether it is to open out a field of, of, of endeavour and thought and practice, whatever, however it is, you know, the, the thought process that leads to that. As I say, he talks a bit about that, and in one of his, well, several of his uh, papers, he talks about three different modes, as he called them, modes of scholarship modes of thinking and writing that lead to the production of something we might call knowledge. The first ones are pretty obvious really. He talks well, first about science, which is, he talks about it the same way that you do. Um, he talks about it from the position of an anthropologist, so he's talking about what science tends to look like, um, how science education works, what, what, what constitutes authority in the sciences, how that authority is gained, those kind of things. Um, but it's fairly it's straightforward and, and uh, some observations about that like for example you can be quite young and be a scientist you don't need to know the minutiae of the history of science you just need to know the, the, the state of knowledge in your particular field at the time you're working and those kind of things are pretty self-evident I think so we're fairly familiar with that the second mode of scholarship he talks about is, um, God, what is he called about? Call it now. Erudition, he calls it. Being erudite. Erudite scholar. And this, is, this is a slightly more old-fashioned mode of scholarship, and it's still practiced and very popular in some fields. And, and to acquire erudition and to be an erudite scholar, that's really about having a great deal of knowledge about the facts of a certain field, and particularly the historical facts. So an erudite scholar might have a great grasp of the particular battles that took place in a particular century, or um, even in something like biology, there's erudition, erudite scholars work in biology. We're very good at the taxonomy of certain kinds of, certain species of insects, for example, or, um, or scholars in, in a particular kind of craft technique, so they will know exactly how something was made, you know, dip into a period of history and they will have just reams of, of knowledge at their disposal, lots of facts at their disposal about a particular narrow area of knowledge. And for that one you do need a grasp of history and you need this, um, you know, a, a long period of time spent soaking up all that information. So, so erudite scholars tend to be older, whereas science scholars practicing scientific methods can be considerably younger. You also need a lot of experience in, um, in erudition. You need a lot of, in order to develop the kind of intuitions, the kind of tacit knowledge. Tacit knowledge doesn't play a great, as significant a part in science as it does in, in erudition. Um, so, for example, if you have a great deal of erudite knowledge about particular painters, about the work of particular painters, 
you'll develop a feel for that just because of sheer dint of huge amounts of exposure. So you'll be very good at spotting fakes, for example, or you'll be able to spot a particular turn in, in an artist's work by picking up details almost subconsciously but at a tacit level just by soaking yourself up in that massive amounts of, of data that you need in order to be quite uh, erudition. So that's erudition and that's kind of science as modes of scholarship. And the third one, I can't remember the exact phrase he uses it, but it's something like relevant connection or connections of relevance or something like that. But it's about a mode of scholarship which he says is practiced more and more in the humanities and even in his field as an anthropologist because he says that his field is marked by erudition and science usually. You know, if you're an anthropologist you tend to know lots and lots of facts about one particular tribe or one particular moment of history or you have a lot of facts scientific information about you know, particular practices but he says lots of fields particularly things in the humanities cultural studies certain branches of history um, some newer fields of knowledge and he says including anthropology um, the mode of scholarship is moving towards connections of relevance. Things connections of relevance, you don't acquire new data, you don't go out there and acquire new data in the way that you would if you were a scientist, or that you might if you were being erudite. If you were a scientist, you'd, you'd acquire new data by doing experiments. If you were, if you were being, using erudition as a scholarship method, you would acquire new data by finding more stuff, you know, you would run taxonomies on more insects, or you would study the works of more painters or you would visit that particular historical period to find out about the wars and that period more and more and more. So, um, so in those modes you do keep acquiring facts. In, um, in, in connections of relevance modes of scholarship you don't. The facts are there, they're available to everyone. Your task as a scholar is to frame those tasks in a certain way, to connect them up in a certain way or possibly to break the frames that have been put there by other folk and institute new frames. So you're not really creating new data. No, you're not really creating new information. You're reforming that information to produce something like knowledge, new forms of understanding. And you get that quite a lot. You get what are sometimes called readings. So you might get um, a certain kind of reading of a particular work. You might get a reading of the works of, let's say the works of Shakespeare, since everybody knows that. You might get a reading of the work of Shakespeare um, using the you know, analytic music, that kind of framing references of Judith Butler or something like that, identity theorist. Or you might get some uh, titles like um, the construction of the male gender in this particular subculture. So you're reframing knowledge that you already know in terms of a particular insight, a particular way of looking at it. And these things are always variable and in flux. Each of these kind of, they differ from the other ones. You know, scientific knowledge stays around, erudition stays around, and uh, it's been built upon. Whereas uh, connections of relevance doesn't, it stays around, but it doesn't get built on in the same way. It gets overturned or it gets reframed. Um, you see that a lot in the humanities it's, it's, it's useful, it is Pascal Boyer is a little bit critical about it even though he acknowledges it has its uses but in some modes of scholarship in some areas of practice in the humanities it's pretty much all you've got particularly those areas where the humanities fades towards the arts you know, that end of, of cultural studies where it starts to become literary studies and where literary studies fades imperceptibly into literature itself you know, once you're in that area, it's hard to run, to run other, other modes of scholarship through that, other than to finding ways of framing that and reframing that. And, it, and it's a creative act in itself, really, which is one of the things why it's, it's a mode that's very common in the arts. Scholarship in the arts is often a reframing, so you will get certain kinds of um, framings or readings of, of the work of certain artists. Where you find connections, you find stories, if you like, that are out there amongst this lot, which can be convincing. 
anyway I'm not sure if that's entirely <laughs> a connection of relevance to your uh, your videos, Ella or Layla. But uh, I enjoyed it anyway. <laughs>